फिर लास्ट वाला डाल देना था आखिर बी डब्ल्यू ये जो है फॉर्म के बाद में डालना अच्छा
program. Thank you so much. Do you have enough space and all to as well? So might I request our respected colleagues to usher into hall two as well. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please bring it up for the host of the Welcome you, sir. Thank you so much. May we all be comfortable in our seats before we usher into the deliberations of the day. To this very august gathering comprising the luminaries from amongst the different echelons of excellence, knowledge and wisdom, Jami Hamdad take immense pride and great pleasure in welcoming you all to this very special, distinguished, auspicious and a blessed occasion of the birth anniversary of our beloved founder, late, late Hakim Abdul Hamid Sahib. Might Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him the highest levels in Jannah. Ameen. We are highly indebted to all our revered guests who have joined us into the celebrations of Founders Day 2021, both offline and online. This is primarily the first big gathering in the post-pandemic era. I welcome you all on my own behalf and on the behalf of Jamia Hamdad Fraternity. The occasion sees the great presence of Honorable Dr. Shashi Tharoor as a distinguished speaker who would deliver the Hakim Abdul Hamid Memorial Lecture 2021 on a very apt topic, the idea of a university higher education in post-pandemic India. The function is being presided graciously by a revered chancellor, Honorable Janab Hamid Ahmed Sahib, whom the world recognizes as a great entrepreneur, entrepreneur and an amazing leader and a philanthropist. Padmashri Professor Iqbal as Hasnail, a renowned glaciologist and a pro-chancellor co-presides over the deliberations of the day. We are indeed blessed to have with us our most respected Janab Hammad Ahmed Sahib, the illustrious son of our founder, who is indeed our vanguard, a guiding light, and is the president of Humboldt National Foundation, our generous benefactors. 
I acknowledge the gracious presence on the head table of our Vice Chancellor, Professor Afshar Alam, and Registrar, Mr. Saud Akhtar Sahib, dignitaries of the dais, my worthy colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Jami Hamdard is a result of the foresight, vision, a rare sense of planning and execution, and the personal sacrifice of the philosopher, scientist, physician, Padma Shri, Padma Bhushan, late Janab Hakim Abdul Sahib. In 1989, he became the first founder chancellor of Jamia Hamdard and was the first Indian Muslim to have founded from his personal resources more than a score of institutions, many of which merged and blossomed into this beautiful modern university and that happened in his own lifetime. No wonder he has been called the man in hurry. The country owes to the vision of this illustrious son the opening of the first minority university after independence as the crowning glory in a life packed with achievements. His vision for Hamdard was a center for learning and healing, a model of other, for other universities. Today, this university serves stands at a little over three decades of young age and has emerged as a harbinger of hope, inspiration, and ideals for innumerable people who stepped onto its sylvan environs with dreams of changing their lives and their destiny, and so they did. It's a land of promises, nurturing generations of doctors, sabibs, hakim, scientists, nurses, managers, pharmacists, engineers, social activists, and lawyers. All this was only possible due to the Masaya named Janab Hakim Abdul Hamid Sahib, our beloved founder. It was for persons like him that the great poet Allama Iqbal invoked and said, Hazaro saal narke sakni benuri peroti hai, badi mushkil se hota hai chaman mein didavar paida. And yes, indeed, he was a didavar, a visionary, a man who took upon himself the responsibility of strengthening the community, the minority, the society, the nation, the humanity with the portion of compassion, love, care, and the most important, the knowledge and the education. A believer of the concept of Vasudhev Kutumbukam, he considered the entire humanity as his constituency. Taking an excerpt from Hakim Abdul Hamid Memorial Lecture, delivered by Mr. Raj Mohan Gadi in 20 years back in 2001, I quote, The name Hamdard is enough to move me, I think. It is one of the finest words and one of the finest sounds of the subcontinent and of the world. May our Hamdardi grow strong and may the Hamdard family grow from strength to strength. Amen. I am good. We are immensely blessed to have the great leadership at Jamia Hamdard, both in the past and the present, who are enjoying our founder's legacy in soul and body, spirit and actions, and that makes the Jamia Hamdard of our times, which is conscientiously and steadfastly taking small steps towards being the panacea of professional education and research. Before we usher into this beautiful, blessed evening, we seek guidance from none other, from the Almighty Allah and from the Holy Quran. Might I please very humbly request our Imam Sahib to come over to the dais to recite a few verses from the Holy Book. किस में पारे में सूरत है और ये उसकी एक छोटी सी आयत है जो मैंने पढ़ी आज ये आयत मुझे याद आ गई और इस आयत से जुड़ा हुआ जो एक छोटा सा वाक्य है वो भी इतफाक से हकीम साहब से ही जुड़ा हुआ है वो भी याद आ गया पहले आपके सामने मैं इसका ट्रांसलेशन कर दूँ अपनी जबान में उसके बाद चंद जुमलों में वो बात बताऊँगा मैं आपको जो मेरे जहन में है हम ये उस आयत का ट्रांसलेशन है कि हम आपको खिलाते पिलाते हैं सिर्फ उस अल्लाह के लिए करते हैं जो कुछ भी करते हैं हम आपसे आपके लिए वो उस उसके लिए करते हैं और इसके बदले में हम आपसे कोई शुक्रिया और कोई बदला नहीं चाहते बस सिर्फ हम आपको खिलाते हैं आप 
آپ کا خیال رکھتے ہیں آپ کی ضرورتیں پوری کرتے ہیں اور اس کے بدلے میں نہ کوئی شکریہ کی امید ہے ہم کو نہ کسی قسم کے بدلے کی امید ہے یہ بات اس لیے مجھے یاد آ گئی بہت سال پہلے میرے فادر جو ہے وہ حکیم صاحب کے ساتھ بیٹھ کے کام کرتے تھے ایک ہی ٹیبل پر کئی کئی گھنٹے ایک دن انہوں نے حکیم صاحب نے ایک چھوٹا سا پرچہ بھیجا اور اس پہ یہ لکھا کہ وہ کون سا اس کا ٹیسٹ ٹیسٹ نہیں معلوم تھا ان کو کہنے لگے وہ کون سی آیت ہے جس میں یہ کہا گیا ہے کہ ہم آپ کو کھلاتے ہیں اور اس کے بدلے میں ہم آپ سے کچھ چاہتے نہیں ہیں وہ کون سی آیت ہے آپ آیت بتائیے حکیم صاحب حافظ نہیں تھے میرے والد بھی حافظ نہیں تھے یہ بات پھر انہوں نے مجھ سے پوچھی کہ تم بتاؤ یہ کہاں پر ہے آیت تو پھر میں نے یہ بتایا پھر وہ انہوں نے ان کو بتایا آگے معلوم نہیں کیا چیز رہی ہوگی ان کے ذہن میں حکیم صاحب کے کہ کون سا کام تھا ایسا کہ جس کے لیے وہ کر رہے تھے اور لوگوں سے شکریہ کی امید نہیں کرتے تھے لوگوں کے اوپر احسان کر رہے تھے اور اس کے بدلے میں ان کو کوئی کسی چیز کی کوئی ضرورت نہیں تھی نہ کوئی بدلا چاہتے تھے بس کیے جا رہے تھے کیے جا رہے تھے اور بدلا تو یقیناً جیسا کہ عیسائی پہ بھی کہا گیا ہے کہ بدلا تو صرف وہاں سے ملے گا جس کے لیے وہ کر رہے تھے حکیم صاحب جن کے بارے میں میں نے مجھے یہ آیت یاد آ گئی قرآن کی اور ابھی مجھے خود بھی نہیں معلوم کہ کی کیا چیز ان کے ذہن میں رہی ہوگی ایک مرتبہ یہاں پیڑ لگ رہا تھا جہاں پر یہ اے بلاک ہے اول کی ڈیری ہے اور میرا بچپنا تھا تو کسی آدمی نے ان سے کہہ دیا حکیم صاحب یہ پیڑ لگنے میں تو بہت وقت لگ جائے گا تو اس وقت جو بات کہی گی انہوں نے وہ بات آج تک میرے ذہن میں رہ گئی تازہ انہوں نے کہا تھا یہ پیڑ لگ تو رہا ہے شاید سو سال کے بعد پھل دے لیکن دے گا اور دنیا اس سے فائدہ اٹھائے گی اور وہ جامن کا پیڑ ہے آج بھی لگا ہوا ہے اور ہر سال اس میں پھل آتے ہیں اور دنیا اس کے پھل کو کھاتے ہیں یہ عجیب و غریب چیز ہے جو ان کے ذہن میں تھی اور آخری بات ہے کہ میں اپنی بات ختم کروں گا کہ پیغمبر اسلام حضرت محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے ایک بات کی جس نے ایک پیڑ لگایا اور اس پیڑ سے اگر کسی پرندے نے فائدہ اٹھایا کسی نے اس کے سائے میں بیٹھ کے آرام کیا کسی انسان نے فائدہ اٹھایا کسی جانور نے فائدہ اٹھایا تو اس پیڑ لگانے کا ثواب اس کو اس آدمی کو لگانے والے کو ہمیشہ ہمیشہ ملتا رہے گا اس آدمی کو اور یہ ایک مثال دی تھی یہ پیڑ لگانے ہی اصل چیز نہیں ہے جامعہ ہندت بھی ایک پیڑ لگایا تھا حکیم صاحب نے اور اس کے سائے میں ہم سب بیٹھے ہوئے ہیں اور یہ سب کا ثواب ان کے نام پہ پہنچ رہا ہے حکیم صاحب کے نام پر میری دلی دعا ہے کہ جامعہ ہمدر اور حکیم صاحب ان کے انہوں نے جتنی بھی چیزیں بنائی جتنے بھی ادارے قائم کیے ہوئے ہیں خدا ان کو ہمیشہ ہمیشہ ترقی سے نوازے اور ہر بری نظر سے ان اداروں کی اور خاص طور سے جامعہ ہمدر کی حفاظت فرمائے آمین ٹو آل ہندی دیوس کے روپ میں بھی بھارت برش میں منایا جاتا ہے سباگار میں اپستت اور سباگار سے باہر جو ہم سب سے جڑے ہوئے ہیں سب درشک گن کو اور تمام دیش واسیوں کو ہندی دیوس کی انیک انیک شکھ کام ہوئے یہ درست گئے ہمدرد ہے یہ ہم اس کے چاند ستارے ہیں تعبیر ہے یہ اس خواب کی اس خواب کی منزل حکمت ہے The Urdu verses of the Hamdar Tarana penned down by our river teacher, Professor Zafar Sir, have captured the founder's dream with panache and elan. Let's all enjoy the rendition of the Hamdar Tarana by the University Choir. Please come. <laughs> چاند 
दर्द है ये दर्श गहे हम दर्द है ये दर्श गहे हम दर्द है ताबीर है ये उस ख्वाब की जिस ख्वाब की मंजिल हिकमत है जिस ख्वाब की मंजिल हिकमत है ये शम्मा ऐसी शम्मा है जिसकी के जहाँ में शोहरत है जिसकी के जहाँ में शोहरत है इस बात तो जरने है हम सब पर तारे बन के चमकेंगे मानिंद गुलो के महकेंगे मेहता की सूरत चमकेंगे ये दर्श गहे हम दर्द है ये दर्श गहे हम दर्द है ये दर्श गहे हम दर्द है नुसरत मुजफर का परचम हम इस आलम पर लहराएंगे इस आलम पर लहराएंगे इस रोशन चम्मा की खात हर तूफा से टकराएंगे हर तूफा से टकराएंगे सर साफ रहे शादाब रहे अल्लाह दुआ ये मेरी है इस गुलशन पर ना आ जाए अल्लाह दुआ ये मेरी ये दर्श गहे हम दर्द है ये दर्श गहे हम दर्द है ये दर्श गहे हम दर्द है Thank you so much for this beautiful rendition. Now, in the most traditional way, we would like to formally welcome our all the guests on the dais. Might I request our team to help us to present the planters? I request the honourable vice chancellor, sir, to do the honours of presenting the planters to our very revered guests. We begin with the presentation to our speaker today, Dr. Shashi Tharoor Sahib. Might I request our honourable vice chancellor to do the honours of presenting the planter? Thank you so much, sir, for being here with us. Thank you, Dr. Shashi. I also request you, sir, to formally welcome our. Head of the family, the president of Hamdard National Foundation, Janab Hamad Sahib. Thank you so much, sir, for all your blessings. I request you further to present the counter to our chancellor, the young energetic leader of the house, Janab Hamad Sahib. I also request you, sir, to present the counter to our pro-chancellor, Sahib, Professor Iqbal Hasan, sir. Thank you. Sir. And I can now request our Registrar Sahib to do the honours of presenting the planter to Akshar Sahib, our Vice Chancellor. Thank you, sir, for doing the honours. Thanks a lot. मैं अकेला ही चला था जाने में मंजिल मगर लोग साथ आते गए कारवां बनता गया. The popular Urdu couplet of Majroom Sultan Puri in actual showcases the highly fulfilling life journey of Hakim Sahib. He rests a furlong away from this place of gathering amidst the scenic beauty and a serene environment conducive to reflection and contemplation, which he chose as his karma bhumi as well as his resting place. He is in his eternal sleep, but the Hamdard Karawa continues to move on. A very short movie showing the snippets from the life of our beloved founder would now be screened. It is sourced from the Hamdard Archives and Research Center located in the campus. I quote Hakim Sahib when he said, Aadmi nahi sunta aadmi ki baaton ko. Aadmi nahi sunta aadmi ki baaton ko. 
پے کرے عمل بن کر غیب کی صدا بن جا پے کرے عمل بن کر غیب کی صدا بن جا سمپل مین ہو لیٹ اے سمپل لائف آر بل ابٹ حکیم صاحب مائی ٹل اللہ تعالیٰ گرانڈ دی ہائیسٹ ایشن آن سب جنرل جنرل کن فر دوس ٹو ہم of such an astute leadership which is bound to bring success and big name to this university inshallah an it professional and an expert of sustainable development and artificial intelligence and alumna of two prestigious universities amu and jamia millia islamia professor alam is surely a multifaceted personality he is an academician and researcher who has authored multiple books produced numerous doctoral and research graduates and published his research work in the most reputed journals in the domain of computer sciences he is perhaps one of the pivotal pillars of the jamia hamdard who has tirelessly worked for its growth and development and contributed richly towards making this campus it enabled he has occupied positions in government agencies like dst dbt aict just to name a few a well traveled person he is known for his grit and determination to bring positive changes to the organization he works for the hamdard fraternity is to definitely benefit from his presence and stewardship with these words i welcome you sir for the delivery of your welcome address thank you so much سیکریٹری 
I take this opportunity to welcome you all to the first anniversary celebration of our beloved founder, Let Hakim Abdul Hamid Sahab. And the important event of this evening is the founder's day lecture to be delivered by Dr. Sasi Jarul Sahab. As you all know, the history of Jamia Hamdad began with the establishment of a small Iranian clinic established by Hakim Abdul Majid Sahab, the father of Hakim Abdul Hamid Sahab. Who was one of the well known practitioners of the Iranian system of medicine of his time? He gave the name Hamdar to his clinic, which means sympathy for all and sharing of pain. His illustrious son, Janab Hakim Abdul Hamid Sahab, carried forward the philosophy and objective of Hamdar in the independent India. Hakim Sahib was a visionary and a philanthropist. Hakim Sahib dedicated his life to the service of the downridden and weaker section of the society. Contribution of Hakim Abdul Hamid Shah in bringing the downridden and the weaker section of society to mainstream education in Prasvati. In another way, his contribution toward the cause of education for Muslims in this country in the independent India is similar to the work done by Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan of Alijad Muslim University. After the partition of India, Haji Khan felt the vacuum created in the Indian Muslims. In another way, he felt the pain of a brain drain of the Muslim in this country. The plight of Muslim man due to his lack of primary, secondary, and higher education were in Hakim Sahib. Hakim Sahib used all the profit generated out of his clinic to form a trust in order to divert all the profit for his clinic to the education. Created many institutions in the country. His dream of making institutions set up in Hamdan Nagar campus a reality on 10 May 1989. The university was inaugurated by late Sri Rajiv Gandhiji, then Prime Minister of India. Hakim Sahib's dedication to the service of humanity, healthcare sector, social service was acknowledged by the government of India by awarding Padma Shri and Padma Bhushan. He had treated nearly 2 to 3 million patients during his lifetime practice of Yunani medicine. Today, because of the effort and reason of Hakim Sahib, Jamia Hamdad has emerged as an outstanding institution of higher learning with distinct and focused academic program in Yunani medicine, modern medicine, Islamic studies, biosciences, pharmacy, nursing, information technology, computer application, business management, physiotherapy, occupational physiotherapy, law, mass communication, international study, and many more. Chamiya Hamdar has very rare exhibition of achieving first rank in pharmacy as per the NRF ranking survey for last three consecutive years and remain in the topmost position since the survey has come into the effect. I take this opportunity to state that most of the other staff and teachers join Jamiya Hamdar work tirelessly to make this institution to a great height due to the close connectivity and they have with our founder and his mission and wisdom. I will not take much time now and make maybe two or more minutes. Now I will come to the topic chosen by Dr. Sasi Tharoor Sahab for this year's founder's lecture, the idea of university for higher education in post-pandemic India, which is quite closely related to actual learning provided by Jamia Hamdar. During the COVID pandemic, I can proudly say that the university activities were, were in full scene with online teaching, online workshops, seminars, etc. As our university is a society-centric, even during this pandemic period, the university has been doing all possible help to the needy and distress through uh, our business employment bureau, one of the NGO founded by Hakim Saab, the Hamdar National Foundation and other organizations. The work related to the Indar Bharat Abhiyan is also going on. I am happy to state that the university achieved high ranking in Intransara Venture of All India Conference for Technical Education by providing thousands of internships to the student even in this pandemic period. Pandemic has been a great teacher for all of us. It has taught us that life is challenging and unpredictable, but we cannot afford to stay in our comfort zone. So be ready to face any challenge in life. 
it is a great honor for us today to welcome and listen dr sasi tharuta who say beautifully india matters to me and i would like to be matter to india as an author politician former intellectual the international civil servant with several world of experience currently he serves me as a third term member of parliament representing devendram lok sabha constituency and chairman of the parliamentary standing committee on information technology he has previously served as minister of state for human resource development and minister of state for external affairs in government of india during his nearly three decade long international career at united nation he served as a peacemaker a refugee worker administrator at the highest level and served as under secretary general to the united nation during kofi annan's leadership then finally i thank all for listening to the lecture of janab sasi tharoor sahab thank you very much thank you so much sir i am bringing in taking in a little liberty just tweak the schedule a little bit i am tempted to call upon a person who is adorning the dais who is very closely associated with shashi tharoor sir and he is none other but our pro chancellor ikbal sir so bringing to the house is professor dr ikbal hasan saheb who is a glaciologist writer educationist and the former chairperson of the glacier and climate change commission of the government of sikkim he is the former vice chancellor of the university of calicut kerala and a member of the united nations environment program committee on global assessment of black carbon in troposphere ozone professor hasnan has served the jawaharlal nehru university as a professor of glaciology in the school of environmental sciences and is also associated as a senior fellow with the energy and resources institute terry new delhi between 2010 and 2013 he was a distinguished visiting fellow at the stimson center washington usa He has long advocated the impact of long-lived carbon dioxide and short-lived climate forces like black carbon, methane, and ozone. He was very much acclaimed. Uh, his uh, his uh, one of the articles was taken up by the Time magazine, which is called as a climate change: the tragedy of the Himalayas. The government of India awarded Professor Iqbal Hasan the fourth highest civilian honor of the Padma Shri in the year 2009. for its contributions to studies on environment to advancing the science of glaciology in india and in a very recent meeting i came to know that he is a great connoisseur of urdu language and he has got a very keen interest in sufism as well might i please request you sir to address this august gathering thank you sir honorable uh, shri sachi tharoor ji member of parliament from tiruvanthapuram chief mutwalli hamdard national foundation janab ahmad ahmed sahab janab hamid ahmed sahab the chancellor of jamia hamdard the vice chancellor professor of sar alam the registrar and distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for my very liberal <laughs> introduction that is not required here uh, but anyway uh, sir city ji uh, jamia hamdard community is hugely honored by your presence today <laughs> you were disappointed when you proposed to deliver memorial lecture virtually perhaps uh, my mail least with riddle emotions has the right impact and you wrote back immediately okay i will do it as well sir so thank you very much shachi <laughs> uh, ji is the celebrity public intellectual of south asia author more than 100 books ranging in topics from riot films i think his title is different cricket hinduism colonialism battle of blonging and the struggle of indian soul i think the last book is still to hit the book store i am still looking for that book uh, and they say that it will come in november he wrote extensively uh, about indian culture and i quote 
in writing indian culture i am hugely conscious of my own subjectivity arguably there is more than one indian culture but certainly more than one view of indian culture literally the idea of india is of one land embracing many culture and that is where the idea of the university is embracing many cultures many communities thank you very much and thank you once again for gracing this occasion today thank you so much sir the man who sits here doesn't need any introduction but i am a big fan what love to let me see to the house to address this august gathering we would now like to call a personality who is a popular among the masses for bedazzling them with his fine speeches and brilliant vocabulary while the younger generation would know him by the memes based on his astounding use of english and as an upcoming stand up comic he also has the skills of an amazing author and a professional politician to boast for along with his previous experience as an incredible international civil servant his several achievements have already been delineated by our honorable vice chancellor so i would skip that dr tharu received his schooling in mumbai calcutta now kolkata delhi and the united states he earned his bachelor's in history from the prestigious st stephen's college and a phd from tufts university fletcher school of law and diplomacy a prolific author with 22 best sellers to his credit dr tharu has been writing for various uh, indian investment periodicals a recipient of the prestigious pravasi bharatiya samman he has also won several journalism and literary honors including the commonwealth writers prize and crossword lifetime achievement award in 2019 dr tharur was also conferred with the sahitya academy award in the category of english non fiction for his book an era of darkness you may or you may not agree with his politics but his brand of multi hyphenate cannot be dismissed for reference just look at his cram twitter bio however it's been amusing to see him gracefully adjust to this viral popularity of his varied lexicon don't get me wrong i know he has always been popular but the many memes and jokes have brought dr tharu's stellar sense of humor to forefront a meme said i quote and this is his favorite one if i'm not wrong i used to be poor but then i met tharu sir and realized i am impecunious and as if as if he is no more poor he became rich and that did not remain poor anymore add on to this note and on this note let's embark upon this evening's enriching and blissful journey with our esteemed guests wo soch le to khayal khushboo wo bol de to kalam khushboo tere tarz e taqallum se ban gaye hain sawal khushboo jawab khushboo with a very warm with a very warm and so the people say that i'm good at words but i'm actually having a bout and trickle with the logic oh. i can't express my words anymore but then i have to bring it to head with a very warm and a loud applause please go to the third the third time member of parliament for tiruvananthapuram dr shashi tharoor sahib for delivering the hakim abdul hamid memorial lecture 2021 on the title the idea of a university higher education in in post pandemic india we welcome you sir please over to the guys Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jeevan Dikpal, for that lovely introduction. My salutations to Janab Ahmed Ahmed, Chancellor of Jammu and Kashmir, my good friend Professor Dr. Dikpal Isnan, the Pro Chancellor. If there's a Pro Chancellor, is there also an Anti Chancellor? Or... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Dr. Afshar Alam, Vice Chancellor. Janab Hamad Ahmed, the uh, President of the Hamdard National Foundation, Sri Syed Saud Akhtar, Registrar, um, of course, Dr. Zinat Iqbal, uh, respected members of the faculty, members of the non-teaching and administrative staff, my dear students and friends. I hope that covers everybody. It's a pleasure to join all of you today, and I'm truly honoured to be asked to deliver the Hakim Abdul Hamid Memorial Lecture. in memory of that great educationist and physician the founder chancellor of jamia hamdar and the former chancellor of aligarh muslim university 
who uh, we all know. I've just had the pleasure of looking at the exhibition outside, which you must have all seen. A renowned uh, philanthropist, an icon of Indian healthcare, particularly in the field of Ulani medicine. His legacy should be a guide for us all in these difficult times. When the issue of uh, public health has been at the forefront of uh, daily life for more than a year now. Hakim Saab contributed immensely to Indian life and the well-being of ordinary Indians. His life and work bring to mind the words of the great Muhammad Iqbal, of which we've already been reminded by Dr. Zinat. Hazaro saal nargis sapi beluri pe roti hai, badi mushkil se hota hai chaman mein didawar peda. But let me add about his great efforts at institution building. Nahi tera na shayman kasre sultani ke jungi gumbad par tu shahi hai basira kar pahado ki chetano. I'm sure we're all in agreement that given these extraordinary times we live in, the theme of this evening's lecture, as suggested by the organizers, is not just timely, but one of critical importance. The widespread transmission of the COVID-19 virus and the corresponding impact of the ongoing pandemic has spared no segment of our communities over the last few months. I'm sure many of us have had extensive conversations on the devastating impact on the health and well-being of our society and on the economic turbulence that is currently being visited upon us all and whether with varying degrees of success by our professional classes. Equally, the question of what comes after the current storm passes and passes with and what the post-COVID world will look like is one that has already gained prime importance. At least uh, Judging by my own experience, I spent a good part of the lockdown speaking on this very subject. Everyone is already trying to think about a post-COVID world. And as recently as last week, I was asked to do a cover story for a prominent weekly magazine, The Week, on what a post-COVID world might look like. So these ideas are all very much on people's minds. But I don't need to explain to a distinguished gathering of educators and students from Hamdard, uh, Jamia Hamdard University, that the, the present pandemic has also posed a series of existential questions and formidable challenges, not just for us, but for universities across the world. I think it's fair to recognize that the current set of complexities our universities are grappling with marks a watershed moment in their common histories. And I think what we're talking about really, about when we talk about uh, India's universities in the post-pandemic context, we really are discussing broader questions of the future of universities everywhere. As Member of Parliament for Tiruvannantapuram, which itself is a home to a number of premier universities in the state of Kerala, as a former minister in what is now more accurately relabeled the Ministry of Education, I'm very conscious of the impact of the current pandemic on our student community, and indeed on our university generally, is not just a, an abstract or theoretical exercise but rather one whose painful realities uh, have to be contended with. Throughout the course of the last year's lockdown, as well as in recent months this year, I personally received emails in the tens of thousands from anguished and concerned students on a number of overwhelming challenges they've been confronted by, ranging from the uncertainty of the administration of critical exams, what this would mean for our students at the height of the healthcare crisis, with lockdown-related movement restrictions between their homes and exam centers, exacerbated by the lack of clarity on postponements, to calls from doctoral students who have not been able to undertake the necessary research and fieldwork to successfully submit a competitive and compelling dissertation, and whose research grants have been unconscionably delayed, to urgent pleas from students in technical subjects who are unable to undertake internships and accrue the practical experience that are often mandatory in their respective courses. To the challenges faced by students on the wrong side of the digital divide as classes went online. And of course, a large number of cases of students who have previously been pursuing programs overseas, but are now caught in the geopolitical torments of closed borders, restrictive immigration laws, and limited international air connectivity. 
We all know that not all that ails our universities and our student life has been a byproduct of the pandemic alone. But there is no denying that existential problems that I've hinted at. Uh, and, and some of the problems uh, go beyond that. The global trend in slashing state support for universities, reduced allocations for research and innovation, and the quality of the output being produced. The over-bureaucratization of academia, India is particularly guilty of that. Over-regulation of our campuses, the UGC telling universities how many students, what faculty, what syllabus, what size classroom, all of that. And of course, the growing threats to the freedom of academic expression in recent years. All of these are likely to spike considerably in the post-COVID world of our country if we are not able to find fitting answers to these very questions today. Now, the organizers have asked me to think aloud about uh, post-pandemic higher education in India. And we can't, I think, approach that vast subject without looking at the larger conceptual issue of the idea of a university, a phrase which I'm sure many of you know is most famously associated with a two-volume collection of essays with that title, published by Cardinal John Henry Newman in 1852, the idea of university. The idea of a university in which teaching and research were combined in the search for an impartial truth reached classic form in 19th century Germany, associated with the famous Humboldt model, which became the dominant global model of the university, a place with intellectual and academic freedom, university autonomy, the growth of independent disciplines with their own standards and priorities, and internationalism. This was a model Newman had in mind when he wrote his books. Though he was primarily speaking of religious education, Cardinal Newman showed remarkable foresight in articulating the concept of the modern day university as an intellectual and liberal engine for contemporary society, intended to serve as a haven for a community of thinkers for whom the cultivation of the intellect could be reasonably pursued for its own sake. Even a century and a half later, his powerful arguments for the value of a liberal education and the principal duties of a university are well worth looking to once again for inspiration. To Cardinal Newman, the purpose of education was not to be merely preoccupied with the gathering of knowledge, wisdom, or even scientific temper, but one that was motivated by the cultivation of a certain intellect and a universal knowledge that aided the enlargement of the mind. What would this imply to the university? To quote the Cardinal, he believed, quote, that as a matter of history, the business of a university is to make this intellectual culture its direct scope, or to employ itself in the education of the intellect, just as the work of a hospital lies in healing the sick of the wounded, of a riding or fencing school or a gymnasium in exercising the limbs, of an almshouse in aiding and solacing the old, of an orphanage in protecting innocence, or of a penitentiary in restoring the guilty, unquote. Now, this radical departure from the utilitarian perspective of the role of education as a tool for economic and social progress has naturally been challenged by the Cardinal's critics. And there's merit in recognizing that Cardinal Newman, who spent more than half his life at Oxford, was writing at a time where universities remained the playing fields of those with social, political, and evangelical capital, those who belonged in those days to the gentry or to the church. In India, to the best universities, those still attached to the traditional idea of the university, are still seen mainly in terms of social privilege, unconnected to the real world of economic and employment opportunities. The Newman idea also makes no allowance for polytechnics, vocational forms of education. In other words, as the historian Sophia de Boyk has pointed out, Newman says little about the level of practical employable skills that should be imparted as part of a course of higher education, revealing his limitations as the ultimate ivory tower dweller. He offers us little help on how the balance can be struck between pursuing knowledge for its own sake and giving students the saleable skills they surely deserve. There's even less to offer on the pressing matter of how the whole enterprise may be paid for. Now, increasingly, demands for research to be economically and socially relevant to help students find work in the real world have challenged the classic Newman view 
of untrammeled academic freedom. At the heart of the matter lies the challenge. What policy should be pursued to preserve democratic access to the best higher education and to match individual talent to intellectual aspirations as well as social needs? Universities are coping with various demands. Students want impressive qualifications. Employers want usable skills. The economy needs innovation. But most universities are still set up in the classic mode to operate in the realm of values and culture, to be concerned more about political issues than market conditions, to be, in short, the ivory tower so disdained by hard-headed employers. Now, for most families in India, these utilitarian concerns are realities that we're all familiar with, perhaps more so because of the fact that in our country, our educational system has historically served as a beacon of hope in a troubling world for millions of our citizens. Even if arguably the education system is not yet our greatest glory, it is of course imperative to remember our humble beginnings on the eve of India's independence. Britain's crippling and debilitating colonial rule left us with only 16% literacy, barely 30 universities, and about 700 colleges with a total enrollment over the whole country in 1947 of just four lakh students. So while India struggled for the next five decades as the poorest, the most illiterate, the most malnourished, and the least gender sensitive major country in the world, with over half the world's illiterate adults and 40% of the world's out of school children residing in our country, the trajectory of our progress since then to our present state is actually remarkable. With Jawaharlal Nehru's vision and efforts to systematically build up a very large system of education and create a large pool of men and women equipped with robust scientific and technological capabilities, sensitive humanist and philosophical thought, and profound creativity, we started an education revival in our country. The initial catechism of education policy that dominated our higher education system were two expansion and equity. Expansion in the number of institutions and equitable access to them for those who had previously been denied educational opportunities because of their caste, their gender, their religion, their region. In the process, we did not always focus enough on the third E, excellence. But there were shining exceptions. Today, Americans speak of our IITs with the same reverence they used to accord MIT. The image of India has changed from that of a backward developing country to a sophisticated land that produces engineers and computer experts. The old stereotype of Indians was that of snake charmers and sadhus. Now all Indians are seen as software gurus and computer geeks. When I recall my days as a young graduate, I think of how few were the options available to us in our college days in the 60s or 70s as compared to the plethora of opportunities presented to graduating youngsters nowadays. Wider options to study, wider employment opportunities to prepare yourselves for. Especially in higher education, there are many more subjects available to study, to pursue. Courses that didn't exist in my college days. And on-campus recruitments from companies and professions that had not been dreamt of in my youth. Evolution means that India must keep up with the world. The IITs, for example, have now launched certificate programs on artificial intelligence and machine learning. This is the kind of direction in which we'll inevitably have to go. Our then Prime Minister, the, the moment of our independence, uh, energy, called IITs India's future in the making. And now, indeed, I find that many graduates from these institutions are making history. But we still have a long way to go with the fourth E, and that is employability. To meet the forces, the demands of markets, of research, the pursuit of usable knowledge, and the imperative of building an equitable society. We are suffering from a systematic problem of skill mismatch between qualifications and jobs undertaken. In fact, uh, there's some, some terrible examples I can give you. I remember reading with horror about the Madhya Pradesh Police Department issuing an ad in 2016 for 14,000 constable posts. 
9 lakh candidates applied for these 14,000 jobs. Among them were nearly 10,000 engineering graduates, a dozen PhD holders, 1,90,000 regular graduates, 15,000 postgraduates, and the minimum qualification for the constable post was just a higher secondary education. Now, as a more recent example, this year, around 8,000 people applied for six vacancies for the post of lab attendant at the morgue of NRS Medical College in Calcutta. The morgue. The salary was 15,000 rupees. The minimum qualification was passing class eight. Among the applicants were 100 engineers, 500 postgraduates, and 2,000 graduates. Now, there are similar anecdotes for every menial job advertised by the railways, state governments, central governments, the public sector enterprises. Why? Because we are releasing graduates into an ecosystem that does not know how to use them. They settle for a constable post as an alternative to frying pakoras, as some who ought to know better have advised them to do. Therefore, even as I speak to you as someone who's benefited from a liberal education, right from my schooling, right through my time at university, I do recognize that there is naturally a desire in India to make higher education more utilitarian, more useful, to link it to the needs of what we hope will once again be a rapidly growing economy in a globalizing world. And this is an argument I understand and empathize with, particularly today in this pandemic-afflicted India, where unemployment stands at a 46-year high, where economic growth has slowed to a crawl, and where the devastating impact of COVID-19 is likely to compel us all to explore avenues to make up for terrible economic losses and a more hostile jobs market, while also, also bolstering our preparedness to weather perhaps future pandemics. After all, as I'm sure many will be quick to point out, a university graduate now employed as a salaried professional is likely to have been better off during the pandemic than, say, an artist or an actor or a professor of 18th century poetry. Now, while this is a fair concern, which I completely empathize with, I would partly counter it by arguing that what our higher education system liberally aspires to do is to essentially equip you for any job that you might get. As I've often pointed out in addressing some of our engineering institutions, we produce 5 lakh engineers a year in India, and 66% of them end up in jobs that do not require an engineering degree. Either because their degree is not relevant to the jobs that are available, or because the quality of education they've had is not good enough for pure engineering jobs anymore. To put it plainly, to my mind, if our universities abandon the pursuit of liberal arts for more technical and utilitarian subjects, this would not hold our graduates in good stead. The principal challenge that would be prompted by universities discarding the liberal arts for more technical and utilitarian objectives is that it will leave our countries with a generation of graduates who are trained to look at the problems of the world through absolute and non-negotiable principles. This works, this doesn't work. This switch turns off, this switch turns on. There's only one way of doing things and no other. The danger of this kind of thinking was borne out a decade ago when an Oxford study claimed that of all those associated with terrorist incidents between 1990 and 2005, wait for this, of all those terrorists identified from 90 to 2005, 96% were trained as engineers. So though no one was saying that most engineers are terrorists. They did draw the conclusion that most terrorists are engineers. Now, I don't know if that study has held up well in the multiple terrorist incidents that have occurred since 2005. But the lesson is clear. A mind rigidly trained in either or binaries and unexposed to the humanities is more susceptible to political and religious fundamentalism. It is a short step from studying the predictable laws of engineering to following an ideology or a creed that also seems to the engineering trained mind to be infused with immutable laws. If our graduates were rooted in the idea that there's only one way to think and work, they are likely to apply the habit of mind and thought to their understanding of human beings, of politics, 
and of ideology, where only one worldview is true and right, and everyone else is wrong, where only one worldview is patriotic, and everything else is anti-national. To my mind, if our universities turned out legions of such graduates, it would certainly have a devastating impact on our communities, particularly in the post-COVID world, where I fear that the increasing move towards populism, isolationism, and the economic and cultural backlash against globalization is only going to get accelerated. In fact, I've suggested we may well see a process of de-globalization characterized by trade restrictions, the repatriation of production and supply chains, and the hollowing out of international and multilateral institutions. That's the theme of the article I mentioned I just published in the week. As I've, as I've often pointed out, the human mind is like a parachute. It functions best when it's open. You don't want to jump off a plane with a parachute that will remain closed. And similarly, we cannot produce graduates who enter the post-COVID world with a closed mind. Our traditional approach in India has been to shove facts into the students from school and college onwards, make them memorize stuff that they were regurgitating the examinations. If this was already out of date when it was being inflicted on the likes of me, it is almost definitely out of date totally for our aspiring graduates today. Because in the 21st century, a world characterized by hostilities, stratified societies, narrow-minded identities, what we desperately need is not well-filled minds. Today in the real world, you can find any fact you need with two clicks of a mouse. So rather than a well-filled mind, what you really need is a well-formed mind. We need individuals who are able to react to unfamiliar information or to discover new information and know how to understand it, how to fit it into a pattern, how to understand the problems and dilemmas that information poses how to approach and identify solutions for these problems. An Oxford Martin School study recently predicted that 30% of the jobs in the world by 2030 will be jobs that do not exist today. How can you educate people for jobs that don't exist? By teaching them not what to think, but how to think, so that they can make the new understandable, bring the distant near, make the unfamiliar into something they can be familiar with, something they can handle. A well-formed mind benefits far more from an appreciation of history or a knowledge of literature or a study of the way in which real human beings behave rather than the world of certitudes that our technical education provides for. As Cardinal Newman so presciently pointed out, and this is a slightly long quote, quote, that only is true enlargement of the mind, which is the power of viewing many things at once as one whole. I'm referring heavily to their true place in the universal system of understanding their respective values and determining their mutual dependence. Thus is that form of universal knowledge set up in the individual intellect and constitutes its perfection. Possessed of this real illumination, the mind never views any part of the extended subject matter of knowledge without recollecting that it is but a part, or without the associations that spring from this recollection. It makes everything in some sort lead to everything else. It would communicate the image of the whole to every separate portion, till the whole becomes in imagination like a spirit, everything everywhere pervading and penetrating, giving them one definite meaning. Just as our bodily organs, when mentioned, recall their function in the body, just as the word creation suggests the creator, subject suggests the sovereign, so in the mind of the educated person, Newman calls him the philosopher, as we are abstractedly conceiving of him, the elements of the physical and moral world, sciences, arts, pursuits, ranks, offices, events, opinions, individualities, are all viewed as one, with correlative functions, and as gradually by successive combinations, converging by an all to the true center." Unquote. So my submission to this distinguished gathering is that the future of our university, what does the topic say, of higher education in post-pandemic India, lies in striking a careful balance between the utilitarian needs of our technical education, which is required to provide uh, for our employability and so on, and the broader liberal aspects that will help our graduates to expand their horizons and cultivate 
their intellectual sensibilities. In order for us to make this balance, however, there is a need to be cautious of a more recent trend among policymakers, which is to try and make liberal arts and humanities education more relevant, almost as if they're trying to reduce this branch of education into an exercise of producing more effective Sarkari Babus, more effective white collar workers, rather than producing deep rooted thinkers. Equally, as we've seen in recent years, there is a very real threat of transforming liberal arts for more insidious purposes, to convert history, for example, into an instrument to legitimize a more Hindutva aligned version of the past, or similarly transforming political science, or as some would say, entire political science, into lessons on chauvinistic nationalism, or even transforming an obsolete English literature into communicative global language skills for prospective call center employees. Such exercises will not culminate in an expansion of the intellect, but on the contrary would constitute a travesty of our higher education system by failing to leave any room for the imaginative, the ruminative, the philosophical, and the theoretical. Education cannot merely be a means to a practical end of a job. You must aim higher. And to return to Iqbal, sitaro se aage jahan aur hi hai, abhi ish ke imtihan aur hi hai. Kyu shahi hai, parwaz hai kaam tera, tere samne asman aur hi hai. So this goal requires us to focus on the importance of the freedom of expression, of academic expression and to ensure a sacrosanct separation of powers and influence between our campus spaces and the forces that would like to bend our education spaces for ulterior gain. These are dangers that have been highlighted by the famous Hindi scholar Purvanand, who in his own collection of essays that have also been published under the title, The Idea of a University, has warned against the growing assault on academic space by right-wing forces in our country that are determined to establish an exclusionary and linear worldview and entrench narrow-minded chauvinistic dogmas on our campuses. To Professor Purvanand, the impact of these assaults, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, so I won't go into details, have a vitiating impact on the future of our democratic society because they undermine the capacities of our society to hold the ruling dispensation accountable. He makes an interesting that between the freedom of expression and academic freedom, arguing that while citizens have freedom of expression but do not inherently have the intellectual wherewithal to examine the claims of the powers which seek their consent to rule them, academics with their long engagement with knowledge have the tools to test the political and policy premises and promises offered to people. They must share it with the public to help them take informed decisions. So they need freedom. Academics need freedom not for their own sake, but for the good of our society. Academic freedom, he argues, is more than just the freedom of expression. It is a basic necessity without which the business of knowledge cannot be conducted. All democracies must therefore resist, I'm quoting Apurvan and here, the temptation of controlling the campus. Now, here is an argument that's well worth engaging with in the context of understanding the future of our universities. The truth is that in the globalized world in which we live today, in the diverse democracy that we are and must preserve and protect, our students are increasingly likely to be surrounded by others who do not necessarily subscribe to their point of view and may not subscribe to the same set of beliefs and convictions or even the same set of cultural practices, culinary preferences or customs that they affirm. In our own country, we've seen how the rejection of liberal cosmopolitanism has resulted in an increasingly fractured society, where many of those in leadership positions today are unable to look beyond our differences and regard our diversity as a problem that must be contained. These are individuals with a monolithic view of the country as one of their own faith, of their own community, and of their own language, and by extension demand social conformity within our society. I think many of us understand that when you see the state of divisive politics in our countries, where people seem to be acting out of hatred and out of stereotyping of an entire people as an other, the inherent lack of empathy has sadly become a distinguishing factor of our leadership. There is a growing deficit of individuals 
who are able to look at people of other religions, other races, and other languages, and actually recognize that ultimately we actually do share the same dreams, the same fears, and the same hopes. Sadly, too many are incapable of broadening their minds in a way that understands the myriad manifestations of the human condition, while at the same time appreciating the universality of human aims and aspirations. In producing the graduates amongst them, our universities sadly have failed us. We must never forget the importance of our diversity. As Anwar Jalalpuri put it, Anikta me jaha ikta mili Anwar, hum is dayal ko Hindustan ke hindi. And this has to be preserved in our universities. It is vital that our universities are therefore courageous enough to remain as free and open spaces where dissent and multiple worldviews are welcome and cherished for their complexity and diversity. And which ensures that in our rambunctious, chaotic and magnificent democracy, all these spaces and channels are kept open. These open channels must enable our students to engage in equal parts with what Cardinal Newman described as the image of the whole and each, each separate portion. <coughs> the future of our universities must be rooted in developing a generation of leaders that is more ready to deal with the national and global order, a world where multiple realities can coexist, where alternative view, worldviews and convictions have to be encouraged and negotiated with, and where students are taught to look beyond themselves and their immediate surroundings to the reality of interdependence and peaceful coexistence. As the British educationist Robert Anderson put it, the idea of a university which combines teaching and research and develops the general powers of the mind, as well as giving specialized training, has three possible fates. First, it could be extended with only minor compromises to all parts of a mass higher education system, but it makes excessive demands on resources and seems unnecessary for much vocational training. Second, one may declare the Humboldtian university to be dead, consign it to the past, fit all universities into a utilitarian and managerial mode. That is how perhaps policies are heading in many countries in the world. Or thirdly, there can be more acceptance that universities have different missions, interpreting the idea of the university in different ways, on condition that access to research led universities is fair and democratic, a stipulation unlikely to be met if they are all privatized or allowed to charge market fees. Embracing differentiation is healthier than denying it. <coughs> now, I would suggest that in tomorrow's post-COVID India, we try to see the idea of a university not as a fixed list of immutable characteristics, but in Anderson's words, as a set of tensions permanently present but resolved differently according to time and place. These tensions include those between teaching and research, between autonomy and accountability, between intellectual integrity and social economic relevance. But they also feature legitimate debates in our country about benchmarking Indian universities against the international scholarly community, about their role in shaping our national identity and defending our national culture. The idea of the university must reconcile the tensions between the inevitable connection of public universities with the state and private ones with the most powerful and richest corporations versus the need to maintain critical distance from our sponsors. We've been reproducing the existing social, economic and occupational structure against expanding it from below by promoting the marginalized and the excluded through affirmative action to ensure social mobility between serving the economy versus providing a space free from the immediate pressures dictated by the job market. Above all, there is the chronic and perhaps permanent tension between universities as places devised to encourage open and critical attitudes against society's expectations that universities will impart useful qualifications and employable skills in the service of India's future. Evidently, in resolving these crucial tensions, a balance must be struck that seeks the impossible to reconcile seemingly incompatible objectives with the ethos of a commitment to a better future for India. We must be far-sighted enough to recognize that at its core, in a democratic society, our universities must evolve into spaces where an ideal version 
of democracy itself is allowed to thrive. In other words, our universities must become the staging ground for experiments in developing the most principled version of our democratic ethos, and by extension, a microcosm of what our democratic, democratic society one day could be. As Ghalib pointed out, nazar ko badlo to nazare badal jate hain. Soch ko badlo to sitare badal jate hain. Kashtiya badalne ki zarurat nahi. Disha ko badlo to kinare khud badal jate hain. We cannot, of course, reach these ideals if we do not actively strive to ensure that our campuses are inclusive and representative. After all, no democratic model can sustain itself if it does not carve out spaces for all voices, no matter how big or small, to be heard. This is not just what we try to rectify through instruments like affirmative action, need-based scholarship programs, and so on, which are important, but a commitment to really taking stock of the barriers to access and inclusion that permeate all levels of our society. To use one example that I briefly touched on at the beginning, as classes go rapidly online in the COVID era, we as a country have not successfully addressed the deep and pervasive digital divide that many families have had to contend with. We live in a world brought to us by Facebook, Google, and Twitter, but we also live in a world where over 3.7 billion individuals do not have access to the internet including 1 billion children for whom it will not be possible to work remotely, learn remotely. According to UNESCO, globally only just over half the country of the world's households have an internet connection. In the developed world, 87% are connected, compared with 47% in, in developing nations and just 19% in the least developing countries. These stark realities, along with other barriers like infrastructure, deficiencies we all know in our country, Basic access to electricity, reliable Wi-Fi, teachers equipped to use digital curriculums, all this have resulted in insuperable barriers for our weak and marginalized, even forcing some of them to take extreme steps in their desperation. Some of you may recall a sobering and tragic event where a class 10 student in Kerala, my own state, hailing from a Dalit family, a young girl who was a class topper, and in the, under any other circumstances would have been set for a bright future, instead committed suicide. Why? Because when classes went online, her family, where the sole breadwinner was her father, the daily wage worker, was unable to afford a smartphone. The Kerala government then put these online classes onto television in a dedicated channel. But there had only one broken television set. The father had no income to feed the family. Where would he get the money to repair the TV set? So the girl could not follow the classes uh, necessary to continue her education. So the girl who was topping the class could not follow the classes. Other students went ahead and she committed suicide. This is the reality of the India that some of us still live in. Realities that educationists cannot afford to forget while we sit here protected by our privilege and discussing what a university means. But it doesn't have to be this way. Our current resort to online education also overlooks the great value of campus interactions for students across social classes and regional or religious divides. When, um, when Professor Hasnain insisted that I come here and not do this online, I was ready to agree, overruling the objections of my own staff, because I believe that meeting face-to-face -face really makes a big difference. And that's true for all of your experiences on campus as well. The comradeship that arises from shared experience and shared learning some have argued that after the initial period of adaptation, online education will become a new norm, that the university campus has really become obsolete. I do not agree. So much of what we learn at university comes from outside the classroom, from friendship, discourse, the discovery of new interests through clubs and associations. A physical campus space is intrinsic to all this. And above all, the university campus can be a place where people can be brought together, where the social barriers of class, caste, religion, are left behind, and where instead young Indians are given the tools to lead an empowered life, a space where narrow-minded and exclusionary ideologies and identities are replaced by a willingness to accept differences and cherish the diversity of thought and belief, a space that is confident enough to look after its wealth of differences as a, and look at it as a strength and not so insecure as to see this diversity as a weakness that must be rooted out. 
A space where the administration is attuned to the aspirations of the students, the next generation of India's leaders, and where these young minds, the engines of our democratic and pluralist society, are not subsumed only by personal ambition or the commercial rat race, but are invested in the success of those around them. If we can manage to do all this, we can develop an idea of a university that remains open, inclusive, and representative, an idea which will become the engine of India. If we can manage to do this, I'm confident that the India of the post-COVID world will be carried forward by a new generation of leaders who will take our country to new heights. That is, to my mind, the idea of a university in today's context. It can be done. You are the ones who can help us do it. Times may be hard, but the challenge we, challenges we're facing are not insurmountable. Remember, आते हैं आने दो ये तूफान क्या ले जाएगा मैं तो जब डरता का मेरा हौसला ले जाएगा दुनिया का कि हर जंग वही लड़ जाता है जिसको अपने आप से लड़ना आता है थैंक यू थैंक यू फॉर गिविंग मी हियर एंड जय हिंद I think less than a standing ovation for you, sir. Thank you so much. An eclectic mix of oratory, dark facts. Although I was getting goosebumps when he was talking of the darkest of the realities of our time, but he gave us a lot of hope by giving us an idea of university. The take-home message is we need well-formed minds. The take-home message is that we have to prepare the next generation for things which we are not knowing. We have to make them actually trained how to think. Thank you so much, sir, for bringing all these ideas into this hall, and thanks for your physical presence. It does make a difference to all of us. We have another few minutes to just have a mix of questions for our honourable guest. I, uh, I hope, sir, you would be happy to take some questions. Sure. So, my dear request, sir, sir, if you could just help. Me. Billion dollars, not exaggerating. Billion with a B. 
every adjustment into each of the children on road. Now, he didn't repatriate that $3 million here by the new Because the problem is that, uh, you know, many subjects, you are not the outstanding top of line daily in the Indian institution because they're different. Medicine is a very good result. So many, many students go off because they can't get into the best institutions. They don't want to settle for the second great institution of other subjects. So they go off and study more. And that has happened now in too many cases. So I think the resources are available in families and in, in, in the private sector and the challenges to get into this country are really different. So I personally have resisted those who have advanced ideological arguments against the entry of the private sector and the foreign industries by saying that this is important. Now I fully share the argument. Then you do that completely, you may turn education once again to the elite students. But the poor will go to government universities and the rich will go to fantasy And the answer to that must be enough government resources of the government institutions maintain their high standards. And right now, the IITs have a brand name around the world that no private sector university has. Uh, even the College of Delhi University and so on are fully distracted. So we should not assume that government sector necessarily means a poor policy, but we have to supply them with another source to be able to maintain those standards. And secondly, we should insist by law, if necessary, that private institutions have to donate and then a certain percentage of their, of their resources and scholarships uh, that are strictly needs-based. So if somebody is good enough to get into a good private university, that person should not be denied the education because he can't afford the fees. If we can legislate that, make it mandatory, that if you want to set up a private university by all means do so, it must set aside enough money that you can give scholarships to say 10, 20, 25% of the students every year, then I think that what I'm talking about would be achieved for both maintain excellence and open avenues and goals to those who are present excluded and marginalized. So that's my somewhat lengthy answer to your frank question. I think it can be done. Six percent may still be a uh, but we have to start moving towards it. And we cannot depend only on the government, but the government, frankly, is getting more and more strapped for resources across the world. Then we would like the defense budget, they're not going to increase the education. Any other questions? Maybe we have a couple of questions. Just okay, pass up the mic, please. Gentlemen in Russia. Okay, hold the mic a bit closer. Hold it a bit closer to you, it'll be fine. Just switch it on, switch that on. Of those students and faculty. 
And you know, I just to most of the universities go there, it goes to zero because the demand for our own people is so great, we have very little space to farm student seats. It's actually not that. Since I was a student friend, we had some African students and Middle Eastern students and so on our campus. Today, there are many fewer of us, partially because they have also more options than they had in those places in other countries, but partially because we don't have the seats. Uh, Mauritius, for example, used to have two medical seats in every medical school in India. So we would train all the doctors in Mauritius. That's completely gone now because we, don't, we can't spare the medical seats. There's such a demand. There's no shortage of seats. So that, that, that is what the internationalization is always here. Research is not zero, but we have a great challenge because our university culture has been by and large a separation between the two groups. See, most of our universities are teaching universities, and research institutions were kept quite distinct, and they only research and don't teach. Whereas the model of which the world rankings were done essentially tried to divide the universities that teach and conduct research. Why not? So this is changed. This is changed. For the first time now we had many institutions in the top five. We didn't have we didn't have any the top two thousand of them. As we should say ten years ago. Now we have four or five in the top five in the Institute of Science, and the IIT Drugs. Um probably I have the top five hundred. But we're still gradually getting there. My own honest view is that we should certainly try and aspire where possible. To matching these global expectations. But right now, to be honest, my priority would be to provide enough education to the kids of our higher education to those who demand it, rather than worry about world rankings, because the world rankings can eventually follow when we achieve a certain level of our universities. Right now, for example, only 27% of those in the age group that will go to university are currently. So more than two-thirds of our country, of our young people, do not get into colleges and universities or do not even consider going there. And this is why, to my mind, we try to get up about 30% to a target of 50% of all those individuals going to university, trying to ensure that we have the real community colleges, for example, to help people drop behind and get up as well as some stream of education. Trying to do more to do quite the same time in terms of such as the resources. I'm very happy to have uh, a decision uh, between those universities. Every country has some that are you know, more outstanding than others, some that are less, some that are more vocationally you know, oriented, some that are less, etc. That's not a problem. But let's try to give everybody an opportunity to get an education. That we hold in the set. And then from there we can start doing all these things. For example, uh, I would love to be once again a place where foreign students will, will come and study regularly on Meridian. But to get to that, we need first fulfill the demand for all those in India. So, for example, as I said, all these students are going to abroad to study, it will be wonderful if they come back. Uh, and, and all of the successive generations will be in the need to go. And they can find the same quality of education. We didn't get it before, the parents are far more stuff. And once everybody is accommodating, then we can also think in terms of accommodating more foreign students, getting more foreign faculty, etc., in order to push Thank you so much, sir. I think I'll take a couple of questions in the chat box. A lot of online audiences also Might I request you to sir, just change the mic and use the one on the table? It's a little disturbing, the calling mic. It's a good test. Uh, this is the one that they want me to use. Okay. Can we give him the... Well, that's clear to be the As you wish, as you wish. So I'm just clubbing these two questions. Uh, what shall be the role of university in this post-truth era where logical fallacies and misinformation is so rampant? Okay, sir, I'll just repeat. What shall be the role of university in this post-pandemic, post-truth era where logical fallacies and misinformation is so rampant? how to inculcate thought in th students to counter this. An allied question, maybe the emotions of the students, all overwhelming. My question is to sir, how are you going to compensate for the loss of university experience during the past two years as our course of study has changed drastically 
and we lack the practical exposure and classroom experience that our seniors experience or later classes will hopefully poor fellows i think they're missing the college life what impact will that have on our career yes well these are these are good questions on the post truth world i must say that i don't believe that post truth exists i think the post truth is the way of saying lies also having more hakim sahibs having more hnfs because that is exactly what the answer to this all problem is and jamia hamdard is actually moving in that direction we have started courses on policy making we have launched a course in medical virology 
And I think a lot of the questions are answered through looking at the founder and the benefactor and this institution. Yeah. I think that, yeah. that brings it in. Yeah. So we have another question, perhaps. So my name is Imam Deshi. I'm from Under National Foundation for Asia Business in New York. Where three students in the science and
beyond the cross, but be outside the cylinders, that they will discover that it's such a resource for them to expand their own mental horizons to get you where they want to go. And of course, it will be that kind of thing. As I said, I have a question for the student of the language. As I said, I have a question for the student of the language. I have a question for the student of the language. So, you have a question for the student of the language. One week ago, he has learned that you have a song of the student of the language. I have a question for the student of the language. किशोर कुमार का कोई नाटक आया नहीं जिसे उसने इंडोनेशिया के बोलते हैं कि अभी अमायर अभी नहीं हाँ बस अभी ये नाम ले पाएंगे तो उसने कहा कि अब्बा आप सर से ये रूप पूछेगा कि आप इस रूप में भी मुझे नहीं चाहता रहे जैसे आप एक पाले में कहीं जाने जैसे आप एक बोले तो रहे और उसके भी उसने आप Take a better bathroom, see you.